Bismillah. I'm Victoria Saba, and I am from Portland, Oregon, and I am a uh, medical technologist there. I work in a medical laboratory. Well, I actually tried to come here last year, and nothing was falling into place. Everything was going wrong, and, and so I just said, um, it's the wrong year for me to go. And so I let it go and then decided that this year was going to be the year. So I had decided that this year was going to be the year. So I prepared um, since Arbaeen last year is when I decided that's it, this is what's going to happen. And everything fell into place perfectly. There was no, no hesitation on anything, getting you know my visa together, my passports, everything. It, it just fell into place perfectly. So of course I did some reading and um, just tried to mentally prepare for what was going to happen. I watched videos and read books, but I don't think anything can really prepare you for what this is actually about, what, what you will experience here. The only way I could explain it is it, it was kind of like a um, subconscious drive to come here to pay my respects and I don't even know, like people had asked me, well why do you want to go? Why do you want to go so bad? It's a dangerous place and I just said, I don't know. I don't know why, I just, I feel compelled to and so that's what I'm going to do. You know, I, I don't think of myself as clean. I mean, I'm, I'm a sinner like everybody else. I don't know why I was called. I do feel like I was called. I do feel like I was absolutely invited, and I don't know why. And I'm not going to think about why too much. I'm just doing it and figuring out the why later. But definitely, I definitely... 100% felt like I was called here, like I was supposed to be here for this. Well, my family, a huge part of my family um, is Sunni, and it's so different because um, they would speak of unity with Shia, of course, saying that we're one Ummah and we should all respect each other. But like on Ashura, we would fast that day, and then there would be a huge party that night gifts were even given and um, there would be uh, you know food music gifts like I said it was just like Eid and um, I remember asking why do we do this how can you be one family when you're partying while your other the other half of your family is crying and nobody had an answer and then um, that started me thinking. And then it was the um, Aisha, almost like the raising her to almost prophethood status. And all the Sunnis do it. And um, so I, I would start discussing that, saying, why do we do this? Because she was one, reprimanded in the Quran. So Allah doesn't even think that she's that great, but, but we think she's that great. And nothing was ever said about Khadija, nothing. And she had always been one of my favorite personalities because she had given absolutely everything to, her pro to the Prophet, to Islam. She gave everything up. And she loved him when he had absolutely nothing and everybody hated him. And it's very difficult to love somebody with nothing uh, that people despise. But then Aisha comes and she loves him when he has power, when he has respect. And it's very easy to love someone with all those things. And it's so difficult to love somebody who doesn't. And so I think it's the love is misguided. It should be love for Khadijah, not love for Aisha. A lot of resistance, a ton, a ton of resistance. Nothing but resistance. Yeah, because um, I was told that I wasn't thinking right, that, you know, it was, I can't listen to that sect of Islam, that that was not the correct way, that the Sunni is the correct way, that the Shia had split from um, traditional Islam. And my answer to that was, well, how do you know that the Sunni weren't the ones that split from traditional Islam because this is, you know, the family. 
obviously not, you know, the friends. So you're the ones that split. You're the ones that are being illogical and thinking illogical thoughts and just, you know, and the, the thing was they were, they would say things like, well, why, why are you so worried about history? That happened 1400 years ago. Who cares? And I, I found when people say that and try and dismiss that, um, that they just, they just have no idea. They have absolutely no idea. And when you try and dismiss history because you don't want to face it, then you're definitely on the wrong path. Oh, I lost everything. I lost everything. I lost family. I lost friends. Um, my husband divorced me. Uh, I developed cancer during this time and my whole support system was gone. So it was just me, just me going through this by myself. And I would do it a, a thousand times over again to be right here where I am at right now. I think it was just all a process of getting to this spot. Well, it's just like in America right now, Islamophobia is rampant. It is really difficult to be Muslim there. And a lot of my friends have actually like taken hijab off. And I refuse to because it's, um, it's just, it's not worth it. This life is so short and my principles are so strong. And I think it's very important as well that when I interact with patients, I've actually had patients tell me, I don't want you touching me because you're Muslim. I want someone else to do this. You're not allowed to touch me. And I think that if I show them that I'm a kind person, that I'm a good person, and that I happen to have hijab and I happen to be Muslim, then that will turn something in their mind to say, okay, well, maybe they're not all that bad. Maybe, you know, the media is incorrect about what they're saying about Muslims. And I've actually had people come back to me later and say, I am so sorry that I treated you so shamefully. I just had never met any Muslims before and um, I had never um, come across any, so I didn't know how to react and I was afraid. I know that with, when people ask me about my hijab, um, they'll say, are you Muslim? I immediately will say, I am Shia Muslim because I want to make sure that people differentiate. There are two types of Muslims, uh, two different ideologies. And they will say, well, what's the difference? I thought there was just Muslims. And I'll say, no, there's Sunni and there's Shia. And then they, um, I usually will say, you know, the ones that wear black, you know, the ones like from Iran. And then they say, oh yeah, those. And uh, then I'll say, you know, Daesh, ISIS, they're, they follow Sunni ideology. They don't follow Shia ideology. And then it goes into a discussion about how we're the biggest victims um, because of this. And uh, then they'll say, oh, I didn't know that. And, you know, it just, um, my hijab opens the door for many discussions. I've met, you know, Sunni that once they find out that I'm Shia, you know, they, they just assume because I'm white that I'm going to be Sunni because the vast majority of converts are Sunni. That's just the first place they go for whatever reason. And uh, so they just assume that. But then once they find out that I'm Shia, then their personality changes a little bit towards me. They're very cold, but I haven't noticed anything really, you know, horrendous that they've tried to do to me or, you know, they'll, they'll just literally just cut me off and just be done with me. And that's not saying that there aren't some Sunni that are really good people, but really good people can be really blind as well and just don't want to look at the truth. Yes. And I also believe you just, you see what you want to see and you don't see what you don't want to see. I mean, if you don't want to know the truth, you won't know the truth. It's just that simple. But if you, if you come to a point where you say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm to the point where I would like to know the truth, then it's so easy to find. It's just right there. The women of Kerbala are so not oppressed. They're so not what uh, the West stereotypes uh, Muslim women to be. They speak out for justice. They speak out for their families. And that's not something the West is taught. So if uh, the women in the West knew the story of Karbala and knew about the women here, their minds would change completely. Okay. So do you think you 
are the best person yourself to narrate this story? I, I don't think I'm the best at all. I mean, I'm, I, de I wouldn't go out and, you know, shout it from the rooftops, let's say, but if someone had questions, I would absolutely answer them because I just don't feel like I know enough. This whole experience has been completely overwhelming. I, I'm just, it's like every day that I'm here, I keep thinking this can't get any better, this can't get any more um, real, this can't be, you know, I, I don't even know, I don't even have the words for it, I don't. I don't have the words for how it's changed me, how I feel, because it just seems like any words I would use would just be not enough, just not enough at all. I would say, I would say it's, it's something, you know, I have never felt, being here, I have never felt more safe, honestly. I have, and which is really sad to say, that I had to travel halfway across the world to feel safe as a woman. When we went to Najaf and we're walking down the street and it was close to midnight and it uh, just kind of hit me that I didn't have to worry about getting harassed or having someone try and rip my hijab off or spitting at me or anything. I, I actually felt 100% safe and that was a great feeling but also really bittersweet because I can't feel that in my own home, my own birth country. And so I would definitely say not to believe everything you hear, that you have to experience it yourself and then you'll know.